Hi everyone. During 2020, NEAT grew by two orders of magnitude from its pre-COVID baseline. In this talk, you'll hear about how the Google Meet, SRE, and software engineering teams organized a massive effort to scale the system and stay ahead of demand. I'll be focusing on how we scaled standard incident management practices to apply to such an extraordinary incident. My name is Sam. Normally, my day job is working with the developer and SRE teams responsible for meetings-related products at Google, like Meet and Calendar. I've got some incident management experience. In my nine years at Google, I've led an incident response about every six months, but none of those were as long or involved as many people as this one did. In today's talk, I'm going to paint you a picture of how in last year, while COVID-19 forced us to reimagine our social, academic, and work workplace interactions, we graduated Meet from being Google's enterprise video conferencing product to being, well, Google's video conferencing product. I'll be focusing today on the incident management portion of the year, which began in February and wrapped up at the end of March. During this period, we had dozens of people working full-time on this effort across teams and organizational boundaries, while simultaneously adjusting to working from home full-time themselves. Despite the unprecedented nature of COVID-19, we were able to leverage well-established SRE incident management tactics successfully throughout our response. I'll tell you more about how we put those together in new ways to facilitate our response to this incident. So in mid-February, our on-caller was paged for server overload in one location in Asia. Traffic failed over, which prevented a user-facing outage, and they upsized the serving instance, but the traffic kept growing. The questions we needed answers to were, where is this gonna happen next? And how high will the traffic go? Could it double? We, being engineers and not epidemiologists or crystal ball readers, had no idea, but we began to map out our contingency plans in any case. The team circulated our COVID-19 readiness assessment to the broader organization, all the way up to senior leadership. After our standard set of mitigations started to not keep pace with our increased demand, we began to ramp up a longer, larger response to the growth. I want to underscore, at this point in time, there was no ongoing user-facing outage, but we established the incident response structure anyway, due in large part to the high levels of uncertainty and corresponding risk of a capacity outage, should we fail to predict and turn up enough additional serving capacity in time. Operationally, our key objectives were as follows. Avoid outages, but if we have to have one, make it as painless as possible, and have generic mitigations ready to use that reduce the user impact of the outage. Procure enough serving capacity meant acquiring more compute and storage resources, alleviating the current scaling bottlenecks in the system, improving the request throughput handled per computing core, and turning the compute and storage resources in our pantry into meat serving capacity fast. And finally, if at all possible, getting a grip on where demand was coming from such that we could build a forecast model to help remove future uncertainty in our capacity planning. For example, could we predict Meet session counts based on how many new customers were signing up to use Google Meet or based on COVID-19 related school closures? We started out mapping across the surface, across the service, what doubling January 2020 demand would look like, then 10x, then 50x, and finally, by the end of the incident response, we were thinking about 100x. This became our target. Due to the large number of people we tapped to join us in the scaling work, we needed an organizational structure for this incident that was more intentional than a slime mold with some incident responders at the top keeping everyone organized. We needed this in order to keep the most people working on the most important and impactful tasks. It took a village. We really had people working on this from 10 different teams and four different sites with varying backgrounds, expertise, and functional roles in their day jobs across the whole globe. How did we get everyone on the same page about what was important? Comms was its own full-time work stream during this incident due to the number of people working on the response and the number of interested stakeholders across the whole company, each with their own set of only somewhat overlapping questions we needed to answer for them. Once one work stream of the project had a good way of organizing themselves, we would encourage the other work streams to adopt the same approach. This consistency and shared abstraction helped us scale the response team to larger numbers of people more effectively. 
It was also useful to periodically publish documents summarizing status for the more passive stakeholders to read and thereby reduce the load on the comms lead. The active stakeholders, so those making decisions based on our status updates, needed to be able to keep updated on all the state that they needed, and so much effort went into effectively structuring meetings, daily updates to executives, handoffs, and chat rooms in ways that made sense. Of course, running a month-long incident like this was exhausting for all of us. We needed to actively manage burnout and prevent it from disrupting our response as much as possible. If there were any single points of knowledge in the incident response team, and one of those people abruptly disappears for any reason, it's potentially quite disruptive and may set back your overall response by you know, a couple of days at least. So we established standby roles for all executive decision makers in our incident response team. For each lead role, so incident commander, comms lead, ops lead, and other leads in the incident, we had a second person in the same time zone as the first shadow all of their meetings and discussions, or at least the important ones. This standby person would then have the same context the primary had and would be ready to jump in and take over their work and decision making if need be. This warm up period allowed us to worry less about whether a current lead might need to take a few days off, got sick, or was preempted by anything else going on in their life. Besides communication, we had numerous other semi-autonomous but interconnected work streams. Each work stream had a lead per site, this was after all a global 24 by 7 operation, a mailing list, uh, internal and intra work stream meetings, handoffs, status notes, docs, bug bugs and tracking hot lists, etc. All of this gave folks permission to ignore the things going on outside their own focus area and to focus on their piece of the puzzle within their work stream. The capacity work stream worked with our resource managers and capacity planning teams to both model additional capacity needs and procure that capacity into a form where we could make use of them in need. To give ourselves a chance to really understand if we were planning for the right thing, our strategy was to normalize resource needs into human understandable product metrics. So in this case, meet sessions or you know how many people were in a call, each of those was a session in this case. Our model tried to answer the question, how many compute resources do we need to handle a single meet session? Shared terminology was critical to scaling our communications as well. For example, we named the pipeline of capacity from modeling it to acquiring it and putting it into production instances called waves so that we, all the work could be parallelized across different groups of people working on different pieces of the problem without them getting confused about which particular piece they were working on. The dependency work stream communicated with the other Google teams responsible for infrastructure services that Meet relies on normally, like authentication and storage and closed captioning, and etc. So as Meet's usage grew, so too did traffic to their services, and we needed to make sure that they were also keeping up. The bottlenecks group was predominantly staffed with Meet developers looking for artificial scaling limits in our code. When they found that, say, 30% of a server instance's CPU was being used to export monitoring data, the team will look into ways of reducing that. Once a bottleneck was removed, we requalified the optimal CPU to RAM ratio, as well as statically tuned binary flags across the fleet. A pattern that emerged was that our binaries often had fixed amounts of operational overhead to do things like logging, monitoring, health checks, things like that. It was tactically valuable to improve request throughput by running fewer or larger instances of our servers. Control knobs were our emergency breaks or fire escapes. This work stream built up additional generic mitigations and overrides that would ease our capacity requirements should the product demand grow quicker than we were able to handle. These knobs were things like the ability to reduce the default stream quality for a meeting or disable the closed captioning button in the UI if we were overloading the caption service or a knob to lower the network priority of certain meet network packets that they'd be dropped first, uh, considering video is fairly network packet loss uh, tolerant compared to some of the other things at Google. Finally, the production work stream made all the other work streams work go live in production. They ensured that capacity was turned up into meet serving capacity that bottleneck removals and control knobs were live in the production releases, and that no changes were stuck uh, pre-deployment. Over time, the production work stream evolved its processes into automation. 
As we gained experience, we could document what had started off as ad hoc operational work. Once the documentation was stable, we could begin automating first self-contained atomic operations, like for example, populating a load balancing configuration file from a template with an argument that specified the new job name and location. Finally, we could automate the entire process end to end by gluing the atomic, atomic operations together and sequencing them. So this meant we could put together, for example, the capacity configuration, the load balancing, the job creation and traffic management, all automated and we could automate the order and sequence and conditions upon which they were those turn up steps were atomically executed in relationship to each other. Putting this together was my job as the incident commander. Establishing an effective structure of information flow amongst all the people working on this was my top priority. By April 2020, Meet had surpassed 100 million daily meeting participants and was adding 3 million new users each day. And at this point, we were ready to start to wrap up our incident response to our large-scale non-outage. Throughout the incident, we'd kept our eyes on key metrics we called vitals and reported them out to stakeholders on a daily basis. This gave us a good way to notice if trends were changing over a longer period of time during something that was easy to get sucked into the details each day as we worked on it. So how did we know we were done, or at least that we could reduce the resources dedicated to managing the scaling incident? We decided to ramp down when the situation was changing on a weekly basis rather than on a daily basis. With a weekly planning cycle, it was much more manageable to use more standard project management approaches to keep things moving in the right direction. And beyond April, we continued to heavily invest in automation to make it easier and cheaper in human time to scale the service up and down if we needed to. This included operations like resource transfers, job turnups on drains, validation and verification, dependency and quota changes, and provisioning configuration. We knew we were in good shape when the scaling work could be given to a single team member to keep an eye on and could relieve the army of volunteers who had helped us get there. Without needing to restart the all hands on deck response structure later in the year, by October, we had 235 million daily meeting participants spending more than 7.5 billion daily video call minutes on Google Meet. And the cherry on top of it all, no outages. And with that, I'd like to thank you for listening to a recap of how we scaled Google Meet during COVID-19 last year. I'm looking forward to your questions in the Slack in the next 30 minutes after this. Thanks.